hey, use code Bengal at sign up on FanDuel. You get a free $20 to play with. Also, check out my links down in the description for Twitter, Twitch, second and third channels for all different types of content that you might enjoy. So be sure to check it out and let's get into the video. What's going on guys, Bengal again here coming back at you with another video today. Back doing another team's off-season plan or preview. Obviously, uh, and this I think it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. This is kind of like a hybrid of my opinion of what they should do and what I think the team might do based on, you know, their situation. And with that being said, each thing is contingent upon the next. So what I mean by that is that if I see a player that gets re-signed or I, pro I project the team to go out and sign, whether it's a, predict a prediction, projection, whatever it may be, that's going to alter what they'll do for the draft. So while you might not agree with me with every pick, a lot of them are contingent upon what they did in free agency and what they did with re-signing players in this video. So without you know all that on the table, let's hop right into it. And that's going to start with the re-signing of players. And I think Jared Cook needs to be re-signed. That is the number one biggest re-sign. He was the best player on their offense last year, I think, without question. Their wide receivers didn't really... Uh, come to play they weren't up to par I get like, like Jordy Nelson is kind of whatever but he's getting older obviously and and Seth Roberts is another option that's is kind of meh in my opinion really one of my favorite players this past year on on the Raiders was Marcel Aitman who was a seventh round pick out of Oklahoma State if you guys remember all the way back to my draft steals video Marcel Aitman was in there and I think in limited attempts he played so well especially in the second half of the season he really didn't get a lot of touches early on. He didn't even play. He didn't see the field. But when they started getting Marcel Aitman involved, he was a red zone threat for sure. He was a guy that was making plays consistently, and he looked like their best receiver uh, by far. And that is, of course, my opinion. I know he didn't have any game where he had a ton of catches, but this is a rookie receiver, a seventh-round pick, that's starting to get more touches. So... I think he's only going to continue to improve, even though his numbers weren't really there. He still averaged 10 yards a catch, had a touchdown on the season. So I'm looking at sky-high potential there. Obviously, I liked him a lot pre-draft. Jonathan Hankins, I think, is someone that needs to be re-signed as well. Bottom line with Jonathan Hankins is I think he had a good season. I don't think he'd be that expensive. This is the one player on this list where I'm like, eh, if you don't re-sign him, kind of whatever. But we're going to re-sign him here. A lot of what... I like to do and I, what I think the Raiders might want to do is build the defensive lineup. I think you need to have a lot of depth because you can rotate guys in and out frequently. If you've seen when I did my 49ers video and when I did the Cardinals video, I love to get pass rushers and more D linemen, keep the guys fresh and keep a bunch of different guys going after the passer and you can get a bunch of different formations, 4-4, four, 5-2 four, with more defensive linemen, more... Uh, of those guys going after the quarterback and I think in a league that's so pass heavy you need it to be pass rush heavy as well so even if we go out into the draft and get more defensive linemen which I'm telling you we will I still wouldn't mind Jonathan Hankins being re-signed he's kind of like you know take it or leave it depending on the price Jalen Richard is someone as well just running back depth I don't think this is an every down starter we're gonna solve that a little bit later Marshawn Lynch is gonna be gone that's, I think, another bottom line scenario. Marshawn Lynch is not going to be there, but you still need running back depth. I think uh, re-signing Jalen Richard makes a ton of sense. And then John Feliciano at offensive guard. He was so good as a replacement this past year. Uh, it was pretty crazy, and I know what you're thinking. They don't really need John Feliciano. Why would they Why would they need him? You got Calicio Semley at left guard. You got Gabe Jackson coming back off of IR. Why do you need another guard? Well, John Feliciano is a guy that can play both sides. He did so very successfully this past year as a fill-in player. And even though he's a free agent, he played for, what, 900 k last year, something like that. So he's playing real, real cheap. And he might want to become a starter. I mean, I would understand that. I really would. But at the same token, if you can say, hey, John, we gave you your shot, man. You played out. None of these other teams were willing to give you a shot. Stay in Oakland or eventually Las Vegas, I guess. Be one of those uh, those depth players for us and, and really make an impact in that regard, even though you're not starting. It's kind of weird, but if they if they can re-sign him and convince him to stay, I think it would be a big move. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to, just because he could be a starting offensive lineman somewhere, and he won't be 
uh, with this offensive line. With the interior, because he's not a tackle. He's a guard. Can't move inside of center. If you have Kalichio Semele, Rodney Hudson, Gabe Jackson, I mean, you're set. The one kind of uh, snafu of that, if you'll say, is Kalichio Semele can be cut, and the Raiders would save like 10 mil with no dead cap, which it may, would make sense financially to do that, but I mean, he's still playing at a high level. It doesn't really matter. I have no idea why you do that, but I guess there is potential for that. And then Daryl Worley, someone that needs to be re-signed as well. One of the best uh, cornerbacks in that group last year, which isn't saying much. I think, what was it, Rashawn Melvin? Not too good this past year. Gary Conley, I think, was fantastic. And uh, Daryl Worley is going to be depth at cornerback. It would make up probably a decent group of three or four, depending on what we do in free agency and the draft. But if you have Gary and Conley, Daryl Worley, um, I think it's a pretty decent combo. It's not I- exceptional. Nick Nelson is also someone that played a little bit. Uh, and he was actually not too bad for the Raiders as well. And he's a guy that came in, uh, in as a depth player that started getting more and more touches as the season went on. Um, so, you know, depth is important. And I think he offers that for the Oakland Raiders. And then Dwayne Harris, it's not it's not sexy, all right? But you know what? A good special teams player um, really helps the third part of your game there with offense, defense, and then obviously special teams. And he's one of the best in the league, phenomenal gunner, and a pretty solid returner as well. So if you can sign Dwayne Harris for, I don't know, two mil per year annually, uh, that's redundant, but over like two or three years, I think that'd probably be a decent plan, decent play for the Raiders here. In free agency... I need to see the Raiders get super aggressive and try to bring guys in. They have so much cap room. They have a bunch of draft picks. They're moving to Las Vegas. In my opinion, even though the Raiders are terrible right now, which they are, they are terrible. If you can have the allure of say, hey, we're going to be moving cities. We're going to be bringing a bunch of guys in. We're going to have a bunch of new talent. Come take the money because the Raiders right now can't afford to overpay guys to come in. So Ezekiel Ansah is a guy that's going to be a free agent. I doubt he returns to Detroit. I really, really do. So if the Raiders can say, hey, we're going to offer you 17 mil per year, 18 mil. I think Ziggy Ansah is probably going to get somewhere around that. He could easily come to Oakland. He could easily be a Raider. They have him coming off the edge. They need edge help so badly. I think the interior of their defensive line is pretty good, especially if you bring back Jonathan Hankins, because then you have P.J. Hall. You have Maurice Hurst, who's really underrated, and then you have Jonathan Hankins. And based on their defense, those guys can all rotate in. They're just like one defensive tackle away in that sense. And I think P.J. Hall's a decent starter, but Maurice Hurst is really your building block on the defensive line. You need some more edge help. I think Ziggy Ansah is absolutely going to bring that to the table. Another guy, Shaq Barrett. He doesn't exactly fit the 4-3. That's the problem with Shaquille Barrett. He's a 3-4 outside linebacker, and... You don't see a lot of guys with his profile, we'll say, uh, as 4-3 defensive ends. But I don't think that it's impossible for him to do that. He is six foot two, about 250 pounds. Certainly wouldn't be the smallest guy to ever play the position. Uh, you look at a guy like Dwight Freeney, who is only six foot one, and he was fine as a 4-3 defensive end in Indianapolis forever. And he only weighed about... 265 so I mean that is some more weight but he was super super quick and uh, Shaq Barrett comes off the edge flying Daniil Hunter with uh, the Minnesota Vikings really doesn't weigh that much for the position although he is much longer he's about 240 at 6'6 so he's got some really good size but I think this is a rotational player you could start him on the edge Uh, it'd be kind of weird I really like him as a rotational guy with the Raiders so if you can pay him to be that come in on pass rushdowns as a defensive end. I think that would work out pretty well. Again, this is kind of a weird one because it's not a great scheme fit, but it's a great player that probably isn't going to be very expensive. So if you can bring him in, I think this would be a good fit purely on uh, a monetary value of him because he's going to be cheap. I don't think he's going to get more than 10 mil per year. I think he's going to be probably 8 mil per year. And he's a really, really solid pass rusher. He really is. So I know it's not a perfect scheme fit, but if you bring in this player, you play him with the same role that he was in Denver, essentially, which is as a rotational player. I think he's someone that adds a lot of value. Super underrated player. I think he makes his team better. So this is the weird one for me, but you need edge help, and Jack Barrett is an edge rusher, so maybe you sacrifice playing him in his exact perfect scheme fit and then rotate him in. 
on a you know second and third down. Not terrible, but this is the big one. Le'Veon Bell to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not going to re-sign there. I say two, but from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Franchise tagged twice. Sat out this past season. Why would he come to Oakland? The answer, in short, is John Gruden is going to want a big playmaking running back, and that's exactly what Le'Veon Bell is. John Gruden wants to establish that smash-mouth style of football again. Le'Veon Bell is a big physical running back that's also super patient and elusive exactly what you need of a modern day running back someone that can help out Derek Carr make him look a lot better than he is and Le'Veon Bell is a super super talented player the Raiders have the money to offer him a ridiculous contract and Le'Veon Bell is clearly in it for the money I don't think he cares about what team he goes to I think he's going to go to the team that offers him the most money and the Raiders could very well be that team John Gruden looking to make an impact say hey I know we traded away Khalil Mack. I know we traded away Amari Cooper. You guys want a star player to watch? How about Le'Veon Bell? He's going to continue to wear black. This time, it's not black and, and the yellow. It's black and silver. Still look pretty good. Le'Veon Bell to the Raiders. I also considered Mark Ingram as an option here, but I ultimately decided that, that Le'Veon Bell would probably make more sense. I, I just think the Raiders are going to offer him a lot of money, and, you know, why shouldn't they? They have it. He is a game changer. He's going to be running again behind a really good offensive line, at least on the interior, and that's what that's what you had in uh, Pittsburgh for so many years. They had some good tackles as well, but uh, I mean, this is a perfect fit for Le'Veon Bell. Now to the draft. The Raiders pick at number four overall. We're going Ed Oliver. Here's why. I know Raiders fans probably looking at this would go, why would you take a defensive tackle here at number four? We have defensive tackles. We talked about it earlier. P.J. Hall. Maurice Hurst, you bring in a guy like Jonathan Hankins, you re-sign him as well. Why would you ever go after a defensive tackle in this spot? Well, I'm glad you asked. P.J. Hall, run stopper. Maurice Hurst, run stopper. Jonathan Hankins, kind of a run stopper. Why would you bring in another run stopper in Ed Oliver? Why would you not go edge here? I think that, that could happen. I really do. Like Cleveland Furl out of Clemson would make a lot of sense. But I think... What it comes down to is we got Ezekiel Ansa in free agency. We got Shaq Barrett. We got two edge rushers. One situational. One's definitely going to start on, on three downs and Ezekiel Ansa. So why don't you go edge at number four? Well, I think we kind of solved that a little bit. You don't need to go that at number four. And I don't think that Jonathan Hankins is in the long-term uh, future of this team. I think he only re-signs maybe two years or so. P.J. Hall is a player that's decent. I don't think he's exceptional. Now, he is young. He is, but what Ed Oliver can evolve to is an Aaron Donald type player. This is a super athletic freak that while he's a good run stopper, he also has the athleticism, the speed to be a, a dominant pass rusher. He just needs to develop those moves and win more with technique rather than pure athleticism. He's already super strong. He's an insane athlete. He's a guy that can offer you a lot of versatility. You look at what the Los Angeles Rams do. They have three defensive tackles that they play, and they move them all around. Aaron Donald, Michael Brockers, and um, and Dominican Sue. I know they play a 3-4, so technically it's like Aaron Donald's an end, but they move them all around. So, and Dominican Sue is actually a player that's played on the edge quite a lot, and I think that's something they can do with Ed Oliver, rotate him just around the defensive line, find the mismatches, and I think what it comes down to is if Cleveland Furl's off the board, if Nick Bose is off the board, you got to go with the best player available. You can take edge in the second. You can take edge with another one of your first-round picks. Montez Sweat's a guy that later in the first round is probably going to be available. Brian Burns. Uh, I mean, there are going to be some good pass rushers available in the late first, second, third. I think you go with the best player available to help out your team, and I think that would be Ed Oliver. Hope I sold you on him, but I, I mean, I shouldn't have to. This is a beast. This is a stud player. A little on with their second pick later in the first round. I'm going to Keel Harry, receiver out of Arizona State. A pure number one for Derek Carr. You brought back Jared Cook. You bring in Le'Veon Bell. They got their number one tight end. They got their number one running back. How about a number one wide receiver? And the Keel Harry fits the bill perfectly. This is a super exciting player to watch. Probably... The most exciting player in the entire draft. I definitely would say that. 
he's a guy that is going to make you miss after he gets the ball in his hand if it's a if it's a short pass he's a guy that can go up and get the football he is as big of a red zone threat as you're gonna find he's gonna make ridiculous spectacular catches all over the field all the time he is the definition of flashy i think john gruden's gonna like that a lot in my mock drafts i have mocked them paris campbell and hollywood brown i think they would like that receiver uh, to kind of take the top off the defense i think john gruden would love that but you kind of already have your slot receiver in seth roberts so i think he's at least decent for now i'm going with a true number one give me Nikhil harry out of arizona state with the last pick in the first round this one should be uh, at around 27 i believe this is the uh this cowboys pick pretty sure doesn't really matter because bottom line they have three first round picks how, how often can i say bottom line by the way it's like what four or five times but chauncey gardner johnson bottom line this is a versatile player that can play safety can play cornerback and i think the raiders are really going to love that versatility we didn't go out and sign a cornerback so chauncey gardner johnson is a guy that can play slot corner he can play free safety you can kind of do whatever you want we're not bringing back marcus gilchrist so we do need a free safety I think uh, CGJ would offer a really good option at that free safety position. You could move him all around the field, could run Carl Joseph single high. I probably wouldn't recommend that if, if Chauncey Gardner-Johnson would move to this lot. I like Carl, jo Carl Joseph a lot more in the box than I do over the top. But Chauncey Gardner-Johnson can play single high. You move Carl Joseph up in the box almost as a linebacker. That offers you a really good sub package. At the end of the day, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson is a mouthful of a name. But, uh, I mean, he makes up for it with his play. I mean, you're not going to get tired of saying it if he's all over the field, uh, you know, making great tackles, showing off that pursuit, and going up and getting the football, forcing turnovers. This is a good player, offers you versatility, and uh, I think that holds a lot of value. Could definitely sneak in the back end of the first round. Round two, we're going Trayvon Mullen, cornerback out of Clemson. Like, he's a good player. I don't think he'll be a first-round pick. He could be, especially with Trayvon Diggs going back to Alabama. Um, but he, he has everything you're looking for in terms of size, in terms of uh, physicality, despite his kind of uh, thin frame. He's got good speed. He's got good closing speed. The thing about Trayvon Mullen is interesting is he, he, I don't think he brings it on every play. I don't think he is. I, sometimes he shows like he could be the best cornerback in the draft. And other, other times uh, he kind of makes you wonder what he's doing. So I think he'd be a first round pick you know without that kind of holding him back but he is a good cornerback he's a playmaker he's gonna force turnovers and at the end of the day turnovers win football games a lot of the time and Trayvon Mullen's a guy that's gonna force a lot of those um only one interception this past year but the past deflections uh were there he's just lo he's locking guys down three interceptions in 2017 it really showcases more uh it is the ACC so I mean you're not gonna see so many of those at the cornerback position really safeties have more of the picks in the acc it, it, just from a statistical standpoint recently which is kind of odd but he's just a lockdown cornerback a lot of the time can come up and make tackles as well i think he's i think he'd find a home here at the top of the second round pretty easily round three we're going andre dillard offensive tackle out of washington state he was super solid um can play left tackle but i think we're going to play him at right tackle here because we already have colton miller at, at left tackle and while Colton Miller probably shouldn't have been a first round pick uh, Miller hasn't been spectacular at left tackle maybe you move him over you play Andre Dillard uh, at the blind side left tackle spot for Derek Carr he he's been solid this past year and I think the third round is pretty good value for him need to upgrade at offensive tackle at least one of them Colton Miller is, is kind of been a bust but maybe at right tackle he'd be better move Andre Dillard over to left I think that'd be a pretty good fit. Round four, we're going Tyrell Dodson out of Texas A&M. Their linebacker depth is is not good. It really isn't. Uh, and Tyrell Dodson, probably not someone that can come in and start her right away. But uh, this is where we really get to the, uh, the depth picks. And he fits the bill pretty well. Round five, more of the same. Kendall Joseph, outside linebacker out of Clemson. I think he profiles more as an outside linebacker. Took an inside linebacker with Tyrell Dodson. And we're just upgrading that linebacking core. These players probably won't come in and start right away, but they have the potential, uh, potential to come in in sub packages as well. Really make impactful plays on special teams, I think is where uh, they're going to get most of their value early on. 
Round six, we're going Sharif Miller and Edge out of Penn State. Just more depth here at the position. Uh, you need Edge help badly, and they could take it early on for sure. They really could. I think Sharif Miller is pretty solid. He was an impact player for Penn State. Uh, doesn't really profile as a high draft pick, so he could find a home here late in the sixth round. We got two seventh round picks. Darwin Thompson out of Utah State to pick here. Just, a, you know, halfback depth. He's not going to be even the second or third running back, maybe, but third or fourth probably could be. Fourth probably is really where he's going to be on the depth chart. Also a guy that could return. He's a guy that, I mean, I don't know, dude. He's like 5'8", 200 plus pounds. He's got a really big head for his body. I, I don't know why that I'm telling you that. It's not really that noteworthy. It's just I can't, I can't not see it. That's kind of off base, but it's true. And the last seventh round pick is going to be Keyshawn Johnson out of Fresno State. Kind of cool. You got a Fresno State wide receiver to go with a Fresno State quarterback. Derek Carr to Keyshawn Johnson. Could be something you see every once in a while. Maybe like seven times a year. <laughs> He's a late round pick. He's going to make his impact as a uh, special teamer and as a an occasional receiver in, in big receiver packages when uh, some of your top guys get tired. It's pretty much what it comes down to. It's the seventh round, man. Checking out what the new offense would be. Per usual, the new guys or the guys that were injured for a uh, significant amount of the year are going to be uh, in pink, just so you can see what the new team would look like with the new additions outlined very clearly. New receiving core, you got Jordy Nelson, Seth Roberts, some returning guys at outside receiver, and then Roberts in the slot. But Nikhil Harry on the far right, pure number one. Really good combo, good weapon for Derek Carr, as is Jared Cook, who is a starting tight end, and then Le'Veon Bell in the backfield. Derek Carr now can just hand the ball off and watch him go behind that awesome offensive line um, where they have some great players on the inside. Kalichi Assembly, Rodney Hudson, and Gabe Jackson would definitely compete to be a top three interior offensive line. Andre Dillard would be solid at either right or left tackle, depending on what they do with Colton Miller, but I think they want him to be their franchise left tackle. And yeah, that is Colton Miller at left tackle, protecting the blind side, kind of. He hasn't he hasn't done a great job. And then rounding out things with the defense, a lot of new additions here. This is what the starting group could look like. Cornerbacks are going to consist of Gary and Conley and Trayvon Mullen. Of course, we know Daryl Worley is a guy uh, that could potentially be your slot guy. Nick Nelson as well are going to be your three and four probably. Also in the secondary, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson at free safety makes an excellent pairing with one of my favorite players, um, really flies under the radar. He was a beast since he was a freshman at West Virginia. Carl Joseph. Linebacking core uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, not fantastic, but you got Markel Lee. You got to hear Whitehead, who they brought in uh, from Detroit a year or so ago. And then Jason Kapinda, who didn't play all that much, but as you can see from his... Uh, his pro football focus grade played pretty well when he was playing, so you like to see that. And then, of course, with the entirely revamped defensive line, except for Maurice Hurst, he's just in pink because uh, he was injured at the end of the year. But you have Maurice Hurst and Ed Oliver on the inside as your main starters. I think that's awesome. And then you rotate in Jonathan Hankins. You rot a, uh, rotate in P.J. Hall. I think it's a really good group. You can move Ed Oliver uh, to the outside, potentially move Maurice Hurst to the outside, Maybe even Jonathan Hankins as an occasional uh, left end instead of Shaq Barrett. Shaq Barrett can can move back to Sam or Will. And then you have Ziggy Ansah off the edge as well. So I think it's a pretty good team. And they're in an interesting spot where they have a lot of picks. They really need to capitalize on their picks. And they could be in a really good situation. This reminds me a lot of the 2016-2017 Cleveland Browns that were absolutely terrible. But had a ton of picks. Had a ton of cap room. And made the most of it. John Gruden has a ton of time to turn this team around. And with a great draft and a decent free agency, he could be looking at the playoffs within a couple of years. It sounds crazy, but I don't think it is. That's going to do it for me, though, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one. Take it easy.